The problem is moral values in our society right now is diminishing. Youth are taking their moral values from sitcoms and movies, considering actors and singers and social media influencers as role models. Slowly but steadily, they are accepting immoral acts as a new norm. Now a man or a woman would be bullied and laughed at just for being moral, while being as immoral as possible is considered cool. Women walking in the streets half naked seducing the public is freedom. Businessmen cheating tax laws and convincing the public into buying overpriced products that they don't even need are considered successful. Spreading hatred and lies and empty promises is called politics. Promoting alcohol and drugs and sexual immoralities to children is freedom of speech. Teenage girls getting pregnant and then abandoning their babies or even killing them is freedom of choice. And after all that, what we get is them making fun of everyone who believes in God or religion or ethics, accusing them of being dumb or that they don't believe in science, while science have nothing to do with religion or moralities. During this hard times that we're living in, we decided that we need to go back to God and his messages to us and his prophets. We have to start from the beginning and learn again what's right and what's wrong, what's moral and what's not, what's ethical and what's not. We're so lucky God gave us examples and role models so we can return to them if we're lost like right now. God's prophets are the best people who walked earth. So we decided to get every information possible about these prophets. And we found only two books in the whole world talking about them, the Quran and the Bible. So we decided to read both. Both contain the stories of Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon and Jesus. Stories were 90% the same, more or less, but there were small differences. So in this video, we're gonna discuss the differences and in the end, we're gonna give you our conclusion and you give us your conclusion in the comment section below. By the way, we're not gonna read the verses out loud, so if you wanna read any verse, you can pause the video, read it, and then resume watching. Are you ready? Let's go. The story of Lut going to Sodom and Gomorrah and all of its lessons of ethics about avoiding sexual immoralities are the same in both the Quran and the Bible. But we noticed one small difference. The Quran presents Lot as a righteous man, a good example for humanity. But the Bible says that Lot was drinking wine every night and sleeping with both of his daughters until both of his daughters got pregnant from him. That is a very weird thing to say about one of the best people that God chose for us to be an example of goodness. The story of David is more or less the same in the Quran and the Bible, but we noticed one small difference. The Quran presents David as a righteous man, a good example for all of us. But the Bible says that David saw Uriah's wife bathing and she was very beautiful so he got her to sleep with him until he got her pregnant. And to cover up for that, he ordered to put Uriah on the front line where the fighting is fierce then withdrew from him so he will be struck down to die. This is another example of turning one of the best people that God chose for us into an adulterer and a killer. That is very weird. Then the story of Abraham. The story of Abraham is more or less the same in both the Quran and the Bible. But we noticed one small difference. The Quran presents Abraham as a righteous man, a good example for humanity. But the Bible says Abraham committed incest. He actually married his own sister, yet again destroying a good example of righteous men chosen by God and presenting them in a very weird way. Next is the story of Solomon. Solomon is more or less the same in both the Quran and the Bible, but we noticed one small difference. The Quran presents Solomon as a righteous man, a good example for humanity, but the Bible destroyed the reputation of Solomon by saying that he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. Again, turning a righteous man into a disgusting example. That's very weird. After that, we read the story of Moses in both the Quran and the Bible, but we noticed one small difference. Again, the Quran presents Moses as a righteous man, a good example for humanity. But the Bible claims that Moses was a terrorist. The Bible claims that he ordered his army to kill the men, to kill the married women, 
to rape the virgins and to kill the children and to even kill the infants. Even if these people were extremely bad people, what did the babies do? Why do you have to kill babies? Bible authors just keep destroying the reputation of prophets for some reason. The story of Noah and the ark is more or less the same in both the Quran and the Bible, but we notice two small differences. The Quran presents Noah as a righteous man, a good example for humanity, and God saved him and the believers using the ark. The Bible on the other side claims that Noah had to collect all kinds of animals from all over the world in the ark, like giraffes and penguins from the North Pole and bears, and put all of them on one ark, which is for me very difficult to really imagine. And also Bible claims that Noah was a drunk, which is also very hard to imagine, because if there's a guy with a drinking problem who told me that God talked to him, I will not believe him. How is it fair to punish people for not believing a drunk guy? Yet again, Bible authors destroy a man of example. And then we read the story of Adam and Eve. We can't really say this time that it was the same in both the Quran and the Bible. Yes, God created Adam and created Eve, and then they entered paradise, then they ate from the tree, which was a sin. But the story and the meaning of life and the purpose of us being here is completely different. The Quran presents God as all merciful. He sent us to earth in this life as a test to know who is good and who is bad in deeds. If we are successful and if we are good human beings, we will go back to him and enter the kingdom of heaven or paradise. But the Bible presents God as an angry person who is punishing us for a sin that Adam committed or Eve committed, for a sin that we didn't commit. The Bible is presenting God as a person who hates women especially. He's making them feel immense pain in birth as a punishment because Eve seduced Adam to eat from the tree or whatever. Even though newborn women are innocent, they didn't commit any sin, but God is punishing them too and making them suffer too. That is very hard for us to believe. And we found more verses portraying God in an unbelievable way. For example, God wrestled with Jacob and Jacob won. Pero te imploro que me liberes. ¿Quién eres tú? Espera. I will not comment on that. God promotes slavery and says it's okay if we beat up our slaves because they are our property. God was tired after creating the universe in six days and he needed to rest. It is very hard for me to imagine that our God needed rest. And all of this pornography in Ezekiel 16, it's not even suitable for YouTube. How can it be suitable for a book that is attributed to God? And all of these other verses that are talking about boiling up and eating our own children. The Bible didn't only destroy the reputation of prophets, but also the image of God himself, portraying him as limited, hateful, violent, and sexist. That is very hard to believe. And finally, the story of Jesus in the Quran and in the Bible, which is making a lot of misunderstanding and debates these days. Quran says simply that Jesus was born a miraculous birth without a father to Virgin Mary. And Quran portrays both of them, Jesus and Mary, as sinless, perfect people. We should learn from them, we should take them as examples. But the Bible has very hard to understand verses about Jesus. We counted more than 60 verses saying 
that Jesus is a man sent by God, is a son of man. Jesus is a prophet. Jesus is a servant. Jesus was praying to God. Jesus saying, they will know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus said he was sent by God to deliver a message, like messengers. Jesus had limited knowledge. Jesus said that God is greater than him. Jesus said that God is his father and our father too, not only his father. Jesus was tempted by the devil, and the devil can't tempt a God. Jesus said that he drive out devils by the finger of God. Jesus said that by himself he can do nothing. Jesus told people don't call me good because only God is good, and so on. But the church, for some reason, still claims that he is God, basing their claims on very ambiguous verses that can have a lot of meanings and ignoring the very clear ones that we just mentioned. If the church's Pauline understanding is correct and we will all be judged on faith alone, not based on following the rules, how is it fair for people before Jesus who had to obey the laws to have eternal life in heaven? They have to obey the laws to have eternal life and you just have eternal life because you have faith? How is that fair? I can't believe that God is not fair giving us simpler tests than the test he gave to people before Jesus. And we both have the same result. How is that logical? And we found some verses that contradicts the ethical standards of Jesus himself. Like for example, Matthew 10, 34, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Sword? And Matthew 10, 35, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Which is very hard to believe about a perfect person like Jesus. Why does the Bible portray a perfect human like Jesus this way? That's very weird. Even historical events in both books are more or less the same, but there are small but devastating differences. For example, the Quran refers to the king of Egypt as king in the story of Joseph and as Pharaoh in the story of Moses, which is historically correct, because the word Pharaoh was not used until the new kingdom. But the Bible refers to the king of Egypt as Pharaoh in both stories, which is historically incorrect. The Bible claims that followers of Moses in Egypt were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So the total, if you add the women and children, will be 1 or 2 million people, right? But the same book of Exodus says that Pharaoh appointed only two women to deliver their babies and to kill their boys. How can two women deliver and kill babies of 1 or 2 million people? That's logically and mathematically impossible. While in the Quran, it says that the believers who followed Moses were a few, which makes more sense. Also, the Bible claims that there were two different pharaohs during the journey of Moses, which is historically impossible. Check out this in-depth explanation from our friends at One Islam Productions. Neither the Bible nor Quran identifies the pharaoh of Moses by name. We can use the details provided in the scriptures to try to identify the Pharaoh. Both scriptures speak of the Israelites being taken into slavery before the birth of Moses. The use of Semites for slave labor occurred only during the New Kingdom period. So, we can place Moses somewhere in the New Kingdom period. This gives us a list of 33 possible Pharaohs. Both scriptures also speak of an exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt. The Menepta Stele is an important artifact that contains the first explicit reference to Israel in the archaeological record. It is dated to around 1208 BCE. It discusses the land of Canaan and mentions the Israelites in relation to Canaan, indicating that the Exodus had already taken place by this date. The artifact is contemporaneous to the Pharaoh Menepta. This means that the Exodus had to take place before Menepta, since Menepta was alive and in power after the Exodus and not drowned in the sea. This establishes an upper boundary in the timeline of the pharaohs. From the point of view of both the Bible and Quran, we are now left with 18 pharaohs as candidates who may have ruled during the time of Moses. Let's now delve deeper into the biblical narrative. 
The Bible claims that there were two different pharaohs who were in power. The first died while Moses was in hiding in Midian. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The new Pharaoh continued his predecessor's persecution of the Israelites, and it was the second Pharaoh who was later drowned when Moses crossed the sea. The Bible gives us a timeline for these events. The burning bush encounter with God took place when Moses was 80 years old. So from his birth to the Exodus, there was a span of at least 80 years, during which two pharaohs ruled Egypt. Now, there is a big problem if we compare this biblical narrative to the timeline of the pharaohs. We've seen that the Bible claims exactly two pharaohs ruled during the 80 year period, from the birth of Moses to the Exodus. If we consider the number of years that each of the pharaohs ruled, we can see that there is no 80 year period during which only two pharaohs ruled. Any given 80 year period will give you at least three pharaohs in power. We can see that the biblical narrative contradicts the historical evidence. Let's now compare the Quranic narrative. Unlike the Bible, the Quran depicts a single pharaoh reigning from the birth of Moses all the way up to the Exodus. The Quran informs us that Moses fled to Midian when he reached the age of maturity. The Quran defines the age of maturity as 40 years old. The Quran also informs us that during his time in Midian, Moses spent eight to 10 years in the service of his father-in-law before returning to Egypt to face Pharaoh. This means that Moses was at least 48 years of age when the Exodus happened. The only Pharaoh during the New Kingdom period who had such a lengthy reign as an absolute ruler was Ramesses II, who ruled for 66 years. The Quranic account is perfectly in line with the historical evidence and fixes the chronological issues that are present in the biblical narrative. The Quran makes the following claim about the Pharaoh of Moses, who God drowned in the sea. We can see that the Quran explicitly states that the Pharaoh's body will be preserved as a sign for future generations. Note that the Quran never makes such a statement about any of the other destroyed nations that it discusses, typically stating that their abandoned buildings and ruins have been made signs for later generations. This claim about a body being preserved is unique to the Pharaoh of Moses. The body of Ramesses II was discovered by archaeologists in the year 1881 CE. The mummy has been on display in the Cairo Museum, and over the last century, it has been seen by millions of tourists from all over the world. In the following documentary, Sir Tony Robinson states that Ramesses II is one of the few pharaohs whose body has survived largely intact. Just across the river from Luxor lies the famous Valley of the Kings, where Ramesses himself was buried. His mummy was discovered in 1881. One of the few pharaohs whose body has survived largely intact. Historically, priests had concealed his body in a secret location in the year 1000 BCE because of a problem with grave robbers. Nothing was known about his mummy in the intervening period of almost 3000 years. At the time the Quran was revealed, the whereabouts and fate of Pharaoh's body was unknown. During the 3000 year period in which the body was hidden, it could easily have been damaged or stolen. It may have even remained lost forever, locked away in its secret location, never to be rediscovered. If you think about it, these statements in the Quran are not only historically accurate, but also represent quite a bold prophecy. Another example. The Bible claims that Joseph was sold for 20 shekels of silver to some Arabs outside Egypt, while the Quran states that the sale happened inside Egypt. Now, thanks to archaeologists, we know that silver coins were only used in Egypt at that time period. That makes the story in the Bible extremely weird. And the last example for this video, because we don't want this video to be hours long, the Bible claims that a gold coin named Darek was used at the time of King David. But historians point out that Darek is named after the Persian leader Darius the Great, who lived hundreds of years after King David. Even the Jewish encyclopedia itself acknowledges this error. 
our conclusion is we believe in God. We believe in all of his prophets. And we have their stories in two books. One of them represents them as people of example and piety. The other book represents prophets as the most wanted list. Why would anyone insist on reading a book that says all of this bad stuff about the best of humanity? while containing historical errors, contradictions, and mistakes. If you check our video titled Was Quran Copied from the Bible, you will see that the Bible describes the earth as flat square with four corners, and there is water under the earth and over the sky. You will find math mistakes in the Bible, and tens of very clear contradictions. But we have no problem in math mistakes and scientific mistakes. The real problem is ethical problems portraying God in a very bad way and portraying the prophets in a very bad way. Like we don't have any example or role model in our lives. Because if prophets are bad people and if God is an angry guy, who will we learn our moralities from? Now we can see why people are turning into atheism. Because the only religious book they know of is not only filled with mistakes, but also immoral prophets and immoral God. I started reading the Quran. I read it completely. It was unbelievable. Everything started to fall in place. Everything made sense. I took the Quran and now I could say to my Bible, I know now it all works together. Now I understand. Because of the Quran, I was able to understand my Bible. And I say, oh, this is great. God is making me a good Christian. He's going to teach me through the Quran. Well. As I kept reading and kept reading, I kept reading the Quran more because it made more sense, it was easier, it was simpler. It appealed more to my heart, to my intellect, to my mind. And my Bible, I started to put it down more. And I started to read the Quran. I decided, I want to pray like them. I, they do prayer. When I was Christian, I just pray. Just kneel my head and I pray. But something appealed to me. When these people get down on their knees and start to bow and prostrate themselves before the Almighty God, the creator of the universe. And you see how the religion works. You see how our religion is so much simpler, how it's so beautiful, how it appeals to the end. They will never even try to read the Quran. You know why? Because the media is filling their heads with lies about it. They think these lies are part of Quran, but it isn't. It is just media lying to you. Want me to explode? Yes! That's what I've been waiting for! Um... Okay, I'll try. <coughs> Hello, Akbar! There are a lot of people who want you to stay away from God. Who are spreading lies about his last revelation. His last message to us. I am sure you heard a lot of these lies already. If you really care about the truth, you shouldn't learn about Catholics, for example, from a Protestant. You shouldn't learn about Judaism from the Pope, right? And also, you shouldn't learn about Islam from an atheist who devoted his whole life spreading lies about Quran. And you just take his word for it without even reading yourself. It's like asking medical advice from an accountant. With all respect to accountants, but they will absolutely give you the wrong medical advice. You went to the wrong person to get very important information. They will tell you Islam is worshipping another god called Allah, while Allah is simply the Arabic translation of the word God. For example, Deus is the Spanish word for God. It's just a translation. It's not another god. The word Allah itself is used in the Arabic version of the King James Bible. Arabic Christians are referring to God as Allah. It's not the Muslim God, it is the Arabic word for God. That's it even for the Christians. They will tell you Islam is violent and unfair and filled with hatred and discrimination. They would even use the T word. All of these are lies. Did you read the Quran yourself or are you getting medical advice from the accountant? They will tell you Quran is oppressive to women while Islam gave women their rights more than 1000 years before Europe even thought about it. They will try to mix evil governments of some countries nowadays with the teachings of Islam to tell you, see, this is Islam, while it isn't. These evil people are the exact opposite of what Islam really is. The media is trying to tell you that they represent Islam, but they are literally the opposite. If you really care about the truth, you should get the truth from the Quran itself and from the authentic books, not from Islamophobes.
only after you read the true scripture you can judge yourself. And before you ask, there is no country in the world right now that represents the teachings of God in the Quran. What you see now is them not following the Quran or making up their own rules. Judge the book, don't judge the people. Again, judge the book, don't judge the people. Jesus in the Bible says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And God says in the Quran, chapter 5, verse 3, Today, I have completed and perfected your religion for you. Can't you see any link between the two verses? The spirit of truth was Muhammad and he came to complete the mission of Jesus. At least read it once before you choose what to believe. Yes, I know, priest will tell you, no, Jesus was referring to the Holy Spirit. But that is absolutely wrong. Jesus said, the advocate, the spirit of truth will not come until I go away. And the Holy Spirit was there. So it's not the Holy Spirit. And also in the same John, it says, believe not every spirit, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So John himself is saying that spirit is equal prophet. So a true spirit is a true prophet, and a false spirit is a false prophet. When Jesus is saying that this prophet will not come until I go away first. So it's impossible to be the Holy Spirit. Quran is the only well-preserved word of God unchanged word by word from the prophet's mouth to your ears. Not even one letter was changed. While until now, we don't even know who the authors of the Gospels are. If you don't know, Gospel of John was not written by John, Gospel of Matthew was not written by Matthew, and so on. It's not called Gospel of Matthew because he is the author, no. It is the Gospel according to Matthew, but the author himself is unknown and you still refuse to read the Quran one time and you base your whole life and your whole faith on lies that you get from the media. Since when do you believe anything you hear in the media without any doubt? Read yourself. When you read it yourself, you will find the truth. And if you decide to give it a try, we can assign an Arabic speaker to read it with you for free, translate every verse and help you grasp the full meaning of every chapter while answering all of your questions from authentic sources, not from random websites or YouTube videos. Contact us using Facebook or Discord, and we can schedule a regular online meeting with you. If after you read it you don't like it, then no harm no foul. Just go back to believing whatever you used to believe. At least you will have read God's message to you and understood why are you created and what is your purpose in life. It's very, very interesting. I mean, if you look into the hate against Islam, it comes oftentimes from so-called Christian apologetics, right? From certain evangelicals that want to speak bad about Islam and want to promote, obviously, Christianity. And that is totally understandable. There's nothing wrong per se with that. Even though if you look deeper into it, there might be. But you understand my case. So it's team versus team, and the Christians want to debunk Islam, blah, 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 and don't read it. And you have many, many claims, right? Book of the Devil, channel book, and whatnot. But in many instances, those people haven't even read the Quran. So it's quite interesting. And then when you start reading it, I can only speak about myself, of course. It just reaffirms what you believe anyways. It just reaffirms, yeah, I believe in one God. Duh. That's what it is. That's what is called the fitra within Islam, right? You just know, of course, yes, this sounds right. But then when it starts dismantling all of those concepts saints right church fathers and just goes away mother of god that goes away jesus son of god that kind of breaks down trinity father son holy spirit in one god surrounding the essence of god and then that breaks away and then you just have god right this pureness of monotheism it clears up the mind as well. Because before that, man, you don't really know how to pray. And you think you have to pray to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, now to Jesus again. Jesus, 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 forgive me. And then you see in the Orthodox Church, for example, you have those icons, and they symbolize certain saints again. And then you ask those saints to speak to God for you. Why? Why all of it, right? And so the Quran is just this... Ah, fresh breeze, this clarification where you just realize, okay, I didn't have to do any of that. 
ultimately. <clears throat> At first it can feel like a guilt trip almost, because you think to yourself, ooh, I'm losing my religion, right? So this is what I used to do, this is wrong to not do. But at the same time, once that mental construct is removed, you think to yourself, why would I even do that in the first place? It seems like you're making things complicated for the sake of being complicated. In Germany we say, why easy if you can make it complicated, right? It's counterintuitive out of the sun. And the further you look into it, I don't know where you're at right now, but the further I looked into it, then you realize, hmm, it's very, very interesting because Christianity itself is a concept, is a religion. It's true. It is a religion. It is a dogma-based religion. Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism. It is essentially something that cannot potentially be the religion of Jesus. It's absolutely impossible. And we know that, even historically. Jesus wasn't calling himself a Christian. That would be counterintuitive, doesn't make sense. So the followers of Christ, so to speak, became the Christians. Judaism, with their prophets, Abraham, Moses, they weren't Jews in that classical sense, right, either. Then you look into Rabbinic Judaism, Talmudic Judaism, etc., etc., and you see how that has been twisted and turned and where it ended up now. So ultimately, the question really becomes then what that religion is, the religion of the prophets. And Islam makes that very, very strong claim that it simply is submitting yourself to God. And there's literally nothing else. And that for me, yet again, makes perfect sense. And that for me is the message of the Quran. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe and to hit that bell icon. Salam alaikum.